in the last class uh, we have introduced uh, some integrals from the standard uh, Riemann integral we have extended this to define Riemann Stelius integral and then Leavitt Stelius integral. So, these are all generalizations of Riemann integral where Riemann integral of a function is defined with respect to x and here in Riemann Stelius integral we usually integrate a function with respect to another function. Usually this function is usually taken to be distribution function or uh, that is it has some connection with the probability theory. So, today we will discuss in detail some of the important properties of Riemann Stelius integrals and also we will discuss a new thing where you know usually we can we have the idea of a sequence of real numbers. Similarly, we can also define or we have some idea about the sequence of functions, sequence of real valued functions to be more precise. So, what happens or is there any relationship between this or is there any connection between the sequence of functions within the limits of the sequence of functions and can we define some kind of integrals with respect to this sequence of function and any kind of convergence whether we can think like that. So, today's uh, topic is mostly related to some important properties of Riemann Stelius integrals and some connection or relation or some kind of transition between this integrals and the sequence of functions and their limits and so on. So, let us just uh, have a quick recap of what is the meaning of Riemann Stelius integral. Uh, suppose we have a distribution function capital F x, g x is a continuous function in the interval, let us take close inter closed interval a to b and we consider a partition p of a b where that means by inserting n plus 1 points between within this interval. So, a equals to x naught less than equals to x 1 and so on less than equals to x n equals to b and we define the Riemann Stelius sum as summation i equals to 1 to n g of xi i into capital F of x i minus capital F of x i minus 1 where xi i is an arbitrary point within the ith sub interval. That means, if we take the ith interval as x i, x i minus 1 to x i, then xi i is a point lying in that interval. Now, we consider the limit of this sum which is limit of n limit as n goes to infinity that means, number of points of in this partition goes to infinity of this R s Riemann Stelius sum. If this limit exists, then we say that this is the this limit is nothing but the Riemann Stelius integral and is denoted by a to b g x g f x. That means, it is clear that here we are basically integrating g s g x with respect to the function capital F x where capital F x is a distribution function and g x is a continuous function. Now, the question is is it possible here we have taken the limits to a to b which are finite. Now, the question is can we extend this limits to minus infinity to infinity? The answer is yes, but there are some conditions. So, we can easily extend this R s integral to infinite intervals, but in that case g x should be integrable over a b with, with respect to f x where a and b are any number on the real line. So, now this Riemann Stelius sum goes toward the limit equals to minus infinity to infinity g x into d f x this is denoted like this whenever maximum of the length of the i th sub interval goes to 0 over i goes to 0 as n goes to infinity and naturally a goes to minus infinity and b goes to infinity. So, under this condition we can easily extend the R s integral to and uh, to include the infinite interval. Another so the next question is as we know there are some properties of standard Riemann integral. So, we should be discuss we should discuss some properties similar to that of the Riemann Stelius integral and these are very standard properties. So, integration a to b g 1 x plus g 2 x g f x 
you can split this in integral of sum as the sum of integrals like a to b g 1 x b f x plus a to b g 2 x g f x. Similarly, we can think of integral a to b g x d of f 1 x plus f 2 x equals to a to b g x d f 1 x plus integral a to b g x d f 2 x. We can also split the interval of integration as for example, in this case a to b g x d f x equals to a to c g x d f x plus c to b g x d f x where c is any point within the interval a to b. Another interesting property is that if g x is Riemann Stringer's integrable or r is integrable and g is bounded that means, lies between bounded by small m and capital M and phi is a continuous function defined on small m to capital M on this closed interval. Then if we define another function h x as phi of g x, then this g x sorry this h x is also Riemann stages integrable or r is integrable on a b. Now, I will just give you this outline of the proof because the proof is very simple and straightforward. Just consider recall the definition of R, R s integral, which is nothing but the limit of this sum g xi i f of x i minus f of x minus 1, x i minus 1, where xi i is the R is R I arbitrary point in the i th sub interval. And if we apply to each of this integral this limit, the proof follows immediately. And this one we need the condition of continuity of phi. So, I, I just leave this proof, the detailed proof, detail proof is easy, just write it down and you will get the proof. Next one is as I mentioned, we will be discussing two important theorems and the first one is Thales theorem, which is related to the sequence of functions. Suppose, a non decreasing in x sequence of functions f n x converges to f x and g x is everywhere continuous and a and b are continuity points of f x that means, a and b are two points where capital f x is strictly continuous. Then limit n goes to infinity a to b g x d f n x. So, remember this is the sequence of functions we are introducing this sequence of functions here with respect to which we are going to find out the integral of this function g x. Now, this limit exists and it is equals to a to b g x d f x. So, this is the famous Halley's theorem and I will just discuss this Halley's theorem using an example. Suppose, capital F n x is something x to the power 3 plus 2 by root n, which goes or converges to x to the power 3 and g x is defined is, is set at x equals to x, g x is uh, taken as x square for x lies between 0 and 1. Then as n goes to infinity, so we should expect that this will fold. So, Halley's theorem states that integral of this quantity limit of that n goes to infinity should converge to this. Now, let us calculate this Lim integration of g x with respect to f n x that is integration of x square with respect to d of f n x that is d of x to the power 3 plus 2 by root n within the range 0 to 1. And simple integration will show that this value is 3 plus 2 root 2 by root n divided by 5 plus 2 by root n. And this goes to as n goes to infinity these two quantities goes to 0. So, this entire quantity goes to 3 by 5 and it is clearly seen that 3 by 5 is nothing but the integral of x square with respect to x cube, which is nothing but d of f x. So, Halley's theorem is satisfied and we can use this result of Halley's theorem, this theorem to get the limit of this integral with respect to this function. Uh, I am not going to give you the detailed proof, but rather prefer to discuss this example using some diagrams. So, as we know integration means this is basically, basically that the area under a curve. So, here this means that this is the area under the curve 
of x square when in the horizontal axis we plot f n x. Similarly, this would be the area of x square in the with respect to the axis which is given in terms of x cube which is capital F x. So, if we can show that as n goes to infinity this area, area under this curve this integral converges to the area under this with respect to this x cube then we are done. So, uh, this is our f n x, f x equals to x cube, g x is x square, a equals to 0 and b equals to 1. So, we plot g x in the vertical axis and f n x or f x in the horizontal axis. First, let us consider this graph. So, for n equals to 1, if we calculate the shed the area under the curve g x with respect to f n x. So, f n x is in the horizontal line, horizontal axis and g x is in the vertical axis. So, if we plot this is the curve and the red shaded area is nothing but the area under this curve and this black curve gives us the integral g x with respect to f x. So, this shaded area shaded by black color is nothing but the area of the curve g x under capital F x. So, you see when n equals to 1 there is a substantial difference between these two area and this part is not covered by the black shade. So, when n equals to 3 if we look at the same picture if we plot the same graph we see that this area that is only red, but not shaded with black is being reduced compared to when n equals to 1. That means, it starts approaching towards this black area. When n equals to 20, this is very prominent that this red area only red area is again much less compared to this one. So, it means that this red only red area which is not also shaded by black one actually starts converging towards the black curve or the black region. And when n equals to 200, it is almost converges to the black. So, if you increase, you would not be able to distinguish between these two areas. So, that gives us a nice pictorial representation of this convergence of rather the demonstration of Hadley's theorem. So, outline of the proof I will just give you. So, capital F n x is a non decreasing function for all n and again we partition this interval. Then consider the integral integration of g x d f x. Now, we can we can easily write this integral within the sub interval g x d f x and take the sum over all such intervals and we forcefully add and subtract this g x i. So, g x i d f x i we subtract and then we add. So, if we add this consider the term with the addition of g x i that means, it is summation integral g x i into d f x. Now, g x i is a constant with respect to x. So, g x i comes outside and d f x becomes just f of x i plus 1 minus f x i. And this part actually is very small because this is with respect to f x as k goes to infinity this become this is very close to 0. So, let us call this is less than theta 1 into epsilon by 3 and let us put this as it is. So, let us suppose equation 1. Now, consider exactly the same thing, but with respect to f n x and do the same trick here we will get more almost the same expression except that capital F is replaced by capital F n. Now, since capital F n x goes to capital F x at all continuity points of f that is our assumption, then naturally if we subtract 1 from 2 this part corresponding to this part goes to 0. So, that also this 2 minus 1 whatever be the expression the entire quantity the absolute difference of this 1 and 2 is less than epsilon when n goes to infinity or n is large. So, just take n goes to infinity the proof follows. So, this is just an outline of a proof just write it down this splitting of so introducing g x i and then subtract g x i and we will get the detailed proof. Next one is Halley Bray theorem. 
So, what is the possible extension that actually leads us to Hilbert theorem? That is a very good question. And one natural extension should be that whether we can extend the limit to infinity, minus infinity and infinity. So, there are un, uh, some conditions. So, if g x is continuous, f n x converges to f x for every continuity point of f x and for every epsilon greater than 0, we can find some number capital A such that minus infinity to minus A mod of g x d f n x plus A to infinity mod of g x d f n x it is less than epsilon. That means that so actually if you recall the Halley's theorem this part was not there this C part. So, it is enough to have g x and f n x goes to f x when we consider an interval a to b. But when you want to extend this entire integral or entire Halley-Bridge theorem to the infinite uh, to, to, to consider the uh, entire real line that is minus infinity to infinity that means that there should be a very negligible contribution towards the two ends or two tails of the real line. That means, if we consider this integral, suppose a is a very large number. So, a to infinity this has almost no contribution and also this quantity which is very close to minus infinity the range the, the range is very close to minus infinity. That means, a is a large positive quantity. So, minus infinity to minus negatively very high quantity this entire contribution of this integral within this range is negligible. So, whenever these two tail portions of the integrals with respect to f n x is negligible, then obviously, we can assume that they do not have any contribution. So, we can immediately get this theorem. So, this is a very intuitive idea uh, of this how the proof goes basically. So, if we consider, so, so this condition is essential to extend it to minus infinity to infinity that means, to extend a to b to minus infinity to infinity in the Halley's theorem, which is known as Halley breadth theorem. So, then under these three conditions we have limit n goes to infinity minus infinity to infinity integral of g x d f n x is equals to minus infinity to infinity g x d f x. So, this gives us a more flexible way to consider the integrals of a function over the entire real line. So, this might be a very uh, important jump from Halley's theorem. Or, or what is stated in Halley's theorem to what is stated in Halley theorem. So, this actually encompasses the any finite interval as well as any infinite as well as the infinite interval that is the entire real line provided these conditions should satisfy. So, today we have discussed some properties of Freeman Stokes integral that is very similar to the properties of standard integrals or standard Riemann integral that we already knew. We also discussed two theorems, one is Halley's theorem, another is Halley Bray theorem, and they are related with the integral of sequence of functions, rather, the Riemann Stringer's integral of sequence of functions with respect to another function, and what happens when n goes to infinity. That means, what happens when uh, what, what happens when the integral to the integral when n goes to infinity. So, obviously, this limit should exist. And we have seen that it actually exists only under some conditions, but usually these conditions are uh, more or less common. And most of the uh, standard functions with which we usually deal with, uh, they already satisfy all these conditions. So, in many real life applications, uh, we can always use, we can use very frequently this Halley's theorem and Halley Bray theorem uh, to get some desired and interesting results. And we will see uh, some of the direct applications of these theorems later on.